Hey, what is going on you guys? Welcome back to the channel. Today, I wanna go over everything you need to know and hopefully make this a good starter guide for you guys that are gonna be jumping into the Wonderlands for the very first time and give you a basis on what you should be focused on and what you need to know. With that being said, if you're new to the channel, consider subscribing you guys. If you do like the video, a thumbs up is always appreciated. And if you have any questions or just let me know how things are going on or what you think, drop them down in the comments. I'm always down there. So with that being said, let's just jump right into the guy. So first off, a quick explanation of what is Tiny Tina's Wonderlands? Well, the Wonderlands are based off Tiny Tina's bunkers and badass tabletop RPG set within the Borderlands universe where vault hunters and other favorite characters can come together and play the crazy twisted game of a 13 year old's mind, meaning Tiny Tina's mind. In Borderlands 2, Tiny Tina convinces the vault hunters to play a role playing game Bunkers and Badasses, also known as Tiny Tina's Assault on Dragon's Keep DLC, which she uses as a method to emotionally get past the fact that Roland died. Assault on Dragon Keep DLC is a well-loved and fan-favorite DLC that added a nice change and deviation from the Borderlands original story arc and lore that added something completely new, which in all honesty doesn't really surprise me that Gearbox made it into its very own fully-fledged game. Now, with Tiny Tina's Wonderlands being its own separate game in the franchise, it's bringing a whole new way of experiencing brand new playstyles and crazy multi-class character builds, all in this fantasy setting world. The developers have really used everything they've learned from past Borderlands games and have incorporated, which so far seems like only the good stuff that we have come to love, in an engaging, fun, beautiful world that we can really dive into and shouldn't sleep on. So what is the plot and the setting of Wonderlands? So without plot spoilers or any type of spoilers in general, don't worry, I'm not gonna do that. The game takes place years before Borderlands 3. During Borderlands 3, Tiny Tina was around 20 years old. Now Tina is back to being a crazy 13 year old like she was in Borderlands 2. You play as one of the space travelers that crash on Pandora and Tiny Tina helps the party out and takes you in as long as you agree to play Bunkers and Badasses. The basic rundown of what Wonderland's story is about is defeating the Dragon Lord. He keeps coming back and he keeps losing but now he's trying to shatter that cycle and stop Queen Butt Stallion and the party of heroes. Speaking of Party of Heroes, one of the characters you will meet and interact with during the adventure is Valentine. Valentine would tell you he's a dashing rogue, but others would describe him as a washed up low rent space pirate. He loves bunkers and badasses, and he's eager to play the gallant savior and immerse himself in the story. Another character of the party is Fret. Fret was an officer accounting bot for decades before Chance encounter with Valentine. Rather than be liquidated at auction, she hitched a ride off planet with Valentine and has functioned as his navigator ever since. There are other interesting characters you will come to experience and most likely recognize like Torg and Brick as we've seen in some trailers. Torg who is a half bard with his magical loot and Brick as you will come to see has some type of magical fairy wings which is pretty funny. Now before starting off in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, what's the point of saving the Wonderlands and playing an RPG if you can't do it looking like a badass and in style? Just like each of the Gearbox past Borderlands games, each game has added more and more different ways to customize your character. Wonderlands is no exception. In Wonderlands, you'll be able to fully customize your very own Fate Maker, which is your character you start off by choosing which of the classes you will be starting class. Setting the stage for your base play styles and skills. Now, the primary class choice is the sole aspect of your character that you can't change later, though you can always re-roll a new character. So make sure you guys think ahead and know how you might want to play a multi-class maybe later on. Now, if you are thinking what is multi-class, we will get into that a little later. Now, remember, you can fully customize your Fate Maker into a bona fide badass, meaning how you want your character to look. If you really want to push the limits, you can engage the slider overdrive option, disabling the limitations and get extra weird in your creation. This effectively makes the sliders that determine the size, position, and angle of certain physical features more exaggerated. So if you want to go wild when creating your character, slider overdrive 
drive will be your best friend. And let's not lie, we're all going to spend countless hours in character creation making some weird ass abominations. Another major choice when creating your Fate Maker is their personality. Think of this as a general attitude with which you will take on adventuring in the Wonderlands and how you want your Fate Maker to talk during dialogue and battle alike. Each personality has two voice options to choose from. You can adjust their pitch to suit whatever your preference is, whether it be a high-pitched Alvin or Balls Deep Batman. Now, you can customize armor patterns, colors, obviously, unlock new looks, and collect many different cosmetics throughout your playthrough as you face off different types of enemies. Once your character is looking as weird or sexy as you want it to be, you'll then be able to further tailor your build by playing around with your starter stats, and those are six basic attributes, which are known as your hero points. Strength, dexterity, intelligence, wisdom, constitution, and attunement. Now, strength is your critical hit damage, dexterity, base critical hit chance, intelligence is your spell cooldown rate, wisdom, status effect damage, constitution is your maximum health slash ward, attunement, action skill, cooldown rate. You'll also be able to choose your own backstory. I mean, what is an RPG without giving your Fate Maker some background depth to them? Your background story will give you a starting place to mold your character stat attributes. Afterwards, you can apply an additional 10 hero points anywhere you wish. Whether you're going for melee focus builds, then strength or attunement uh, will be best choices for higher damage and action skill cooldowns to constantly spam your action skill. Or if a spell focus build, intelligence or wisdom are two really good ones to focus on. But the nice thing about Wonderlands is the many different crazy builds and play styles we will be able to mess around with. Now, if you do wish to change anything about your character, say your look, voice, hero points, skill points, or emotes, you can simply visit a quick change station. But there's a catch in Wonderlands, and that is your primary class choice is set in stone. You will not be able to change it later. You'll have to create a new character. Now that you've customized your character and gave them some backstory, it is time to choose your primary class. There are six available classes as of now. First up, the Berserker, which is exactly what you would think when hearing the name, Berserker. The Berserker class specializes in both melee and frost damage. Their action skills can freeze and shatter enemies with raw destructive force by using Dreadwind action skill, which is a spin of whirlwind damage slashing anything in their path, or by using Feral Surge that makes the Berserker leap toward their target and smash the ground dealing frost damage to all enemies nearby. They can also channel their bloodthirsty by leeching life from slain enemies. So, next up, if you've always wanted to play a Thor-style character outside of the Marvel Universe, then this will be right up your alley, the Clawbringer class. Clawbringers focus on fire and lightning damage. They can use Dragon Aura to empower and buff their whole party with additional fire damage and more. The Clawbringer also comes with a trusty Wyvern companion that breathes fire on enemies and does a lot more. Reminds me of a lot of Mordecai's Bloodwing from the first two Borderlands. They can either throw their Spectral Hammer at enemies to deal lightning damage or slam it down on the ground to create a massive Fire Nova. The action skill Cleansing Flame gives you the Clawbringer's ability to slam their hammer into the ground, while the Storm Dragon's Judgment allows you to hurl your weapon into enemies, causing lightning damage and will stick where it lands, but an awesome feature to this skill is tapping the action button again and bringing your hammer back to you damaging enemies on the way and ending your action skill early but refunding a portion of the cooldown. Now, the next class I find really interesting and most likely will require a good understanding of how to properly play, which is nice because a lot of D&D has classes like that where they are not your typical hack and slash pick up and just play classes. Not saying it will be too difficult or hard to pick up on, but after hearing a lot of chatter on the Graveborn class and watching gameplay, it's definitely an interesting class. The Graveborn is going to be more focused, high crit, master of kill skills, spells, and dark magic. Graveborn has a demi-lich companion that can cast unique spells of their own and even trigger kill skills to summon minions but Greyborn's high damage and massive power all comes at a cost that's paid with your health or your enemy's health 
The two action skills that come with Greyborn class are Dire Sacrifice, that sacrifices some of their current health to deal dark magic damage and deals huge amounts of bonus damage, and then the Reaper of Bones action skill that fully heals and gains leech efficiency and deals bonus dark magic damage for a duration, but loses an ever-increasing amount of health per second. When your Greyborn dies, they become invulnerable for a duration, restoring some of their health and Reaper of Bones finally ends. But since we're on the topic of spells and magic, the spell shot class is just as you would think. If you're looking for a more of your wizard style mage build by being a straight up glass cannon and combining spells with guns, then spell shot is your class. With their spell weaving ability, increasing spell damage and fire rate as they can cast spells or reload, which gives them a fluid seamless ability to cycle between different methods of damage dealing. They also have a polymorph ability to turn enemies into skeet, aka their Wonderland's version of a sheep. Their two action skills are ambihextrous, which is being able to equip two spells at once, one in each hand, say dropping a barrage of ice to freeze enemies and then hitting them with some type of infernal blast to wipe them out, or use the polymorph action skill that turns enemies into skeep for a few seconds and anyone you, anyone you damage the skeep has a chance to cast a free spell. Another class introduced is the Spore Warden, which speed and distance are your best friend. You get a Mushroom Companion that can target nearby enemies and deal poison damage. If you ping an enemy, your Mushroom Companion will attack them similar to Flax Pets in Borderlands 3. Spore Warden deals in Frost Cyclones with Blizzard Action Skills that seek out enemies and Barrage Action Skill that summons a Mystical Bow firing 7 arrows that ricochet between enemies twice. It also has multiple charges. Now last but definitely not least is the Stabomancer class which acts as your rogue in the shadows dealing high amounts of critical hits and status effects. They have superior high speed which makes it easy to evade damage and can also shoot while sprinting which is an awesome feature to their class and really changes up the gameplay. Can't wait to see speedrunners with this class. Their ghost blade action skill throws out a blade that spins in place at a location of your choosing. You can also hit the action skill button again while active and cause the ghost blade to teleport to a targeted location. From the shadows is a second action skill where the stabomancer enters a stealth mode turning invisible all damage dealt is automatically a critical hit. So those are the six classes that obviously have their very own skill trees with passive skills that you can sink points into any of the nodes of your choosing. Now, as long as you've leveled high enough and gaining more skill points for your skill trees, the more points you put in, the more the tree will become unlocked, opening up more passive skills to sink points into and try out for particular builds. Now, the more you progress through the game, you've gotten far enough, you will then unlock the multi-class system, which is where you will be able to pick a secondary class. You can sink skill points into as you level up, but you'll need to pick and choose carefully where you want to allocate them as it's impossible to fill up every ability across both of your skill trees. If you do decide you want to maybe change any skill points to another node or try something different, you can do so for gold at a quick change station. Now remember, you cannot change the primary class you chose at the start of the game. That is permanent. But once you've completed the main story, you will unlock an option to change your secondary class if you choose to do so. This still gives great flexibility in making builds in a case the secondary class you choose just isn't working out or you're just not having fun with that particular class. Now that we have an understanding of the classes a little bit and your character is set how you want, it's time to journey into the Wonderlands. So one of the cool features in Wonderlands is the overworld. It is an expansive map that connects the many hotspots of the Wonderlands, which gives it that tabletop RPG style feeling where you can take a break from the first person perspective and enter this third person bobblehead view and venture off the beaten path in the overworld. You can find all kinds of goodies including extra chests full of gold, hidden collectibles like lucky dice and pieces of buff granting shrines and even entirely optional areas with their own quest lines. But what else is an awesome addition is you might catch the attention of an enemy itching for a random encounter. If you're not really in the mood to fight, you can simply run away or punch out your attacker before they even reach you. But the benefit is there's loot to be had if you choose to fight that random encounter head on. 
One of the coolest things I find in Wonderlands is the tavern, Izzy's Fizzies. Now, Izzy's Tavern, which acts as the central hub in Wonderlands, and senior writer Sam Winkler even said it's basically Sanctuary. Sanctuary we had in Borderlands 2 and 3. And that anyone who's played a DD d knows all too well how many adventures begin in a noisy, smoky confines at a tavern. And like Sanctuary in Borderlands 3 here at Izzy's Tavern, as you progress through the game, the tavern changes. So say you slay a beast, later on when you come back to the tavern, the head of that beast might be mounted on the wall. They went on to say each player's tavern will be different. So if you bring friends into your tavern, you can show off and flex what you guys have accomplished already. By the end of Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, the tavern will be totally different. This is a perfect setting, even if it was specifically chosen because of its tabletop RPG trope. So, side note, keep an eye out on poems within the campaign. The poet in Izzy's Tavern recites them once you return to the tavern. Here at Izzy's is where you can also pick up additional quests, meet NPC characters, and much more. Now, as you venture through the Wonderlands, each starting zone or area, just like in the Borderlands games, will still have vending machines where you'll be able to restock ammo, sell, or buy gear. Now, the gear you can equip are similar to what we would see in Borderlands games, just different names. Like, instead of shields, they are now called wards. But there are newly added slots for gear such as rings and amulets, rings being more boost to your loadout, example being increases to action skill duration, damage, or magazine size for a given gun type or companion damage, and more. Amulets grant special effects like a chance to instantly reload your equipped guns ammo after a melee hit or they can also increase things like classes power and damage. There is now actually armor mod, you know, it shows like a little piece of armor, like a chest piece you equip in a gear slot now, which I feel just is the same as our artifacts were in Borderlands 3, but instead it's now called armor instead. I mean, it goes with the D&D theme, so it does make sense, and I do like it. Now, your Fate Maker will be able to equip five weapons, four gun slots, and one dedicated melee weapon slot. But that's really not all, because down in the gear section of your character, you will be able to equip different spells, which is pretty much replacing your grenade mod that we would have in the Borderlands games. You'll be able to use them similar as an action skill, as you see down in the lower right corner of the screen. There are many different spells in the Wonderlands, and there are four houses that manufacture spells. First house spell being Conjura, which simply fire and forget. With simple casting, the Conjura, these are your most basic variety of spell. Just point, cast, and watch the destruction unfold. Second house spell being Arkham, store up your mystic energies and then release them in a focus blast with Arkham spells. The longer you hold the casting button, the more powerful the effect will be. The third house spell being the Weird Weaver. Channeling your magical might into a steady stream of sorcery, the Weird Weaver, by pressing and holding the cast button, you can continuously unleash projectiles or beams until nothing is left standing in your way. The fourth house spell being Miraculum. Surrounding yourself with an arcane via the self-casting spell of Miraculum, these spells activate at close range and include explosive elemental fissures that obliterate nearby baddies, and circles of protection that can shield you and your allies. So spells are not the only new and different feature added, if comparing to Borderlands of course. We now get a dedicated melee weapon slot as I stated earlier. Melee weapons are treated the same as guns in the game, meaning they will drop with random perks and unique properties. Melee weapons come in four core varieties, axes, blunt weapons, and one and two handed swords. There are four melee manufacturers, you should know which are Swift, Valora, Cleave, and Bonk. Depending on your playstyle, picking the right melee weapon can go a long way. Now, one thing that remains the same are the guns. It's a Wonderlands game, so it has guns, pistols, assault rifles, SMGs, sniper rifles, shotguns, and heavy weapons. What is new, though, are some of the manufacturers of these weapons. There are seven gun manufacturers in Wonderlands. Dahlia, the Dahlia guns, you will be able to alternate firing modes from full auto to burst or semi, just like in previous Borderlands games. Black powder guns, popping headshots, or critical hits will cause your bullets to ricochet, damaging nearby enemies as a bonus. Furier guns can take on new forms as you fling them across the battlefield like wing blasters, and bouncing bombs. Stoker guns have an extremely high fire rate, 
more of your spray and pray style weapon. Torg guns are still the same as in Borderlands, explosive rounds. More explosions in your explosions. Some can even shoot magical mines that stick to enemies. Skull dagger guns never need to be reloaded as they continuously regenerate their own ammo supply from the ether. But you'll have to let it off, you know, you can't just hold the trigger down non-stop. You'll have to let off eventually to let the weapon cool down or you're going to risk it overheating. I'd say it's very comparable to the COV weapons in Borderlands 3. Hyperius guns are pretty much the Hyperion weapons from Borderlands 3 and 2 where aiming down the sights pulls up a shield to help take damage. Also, the more you shoot, the more accurate they become. Each weapon manufacturers have a different twist on how their guns work with unique firing modes. If ever played a previous Borderlands game, you'll feel right at home. Onto the elemental damage, which can be part of your class skill, on your weapons, either melee or guns, or type of spell you have equipped, or maybe just a barrel of poison, fire, laying somewhere on the ground that you can shoot and inflict damage on enemies. There are five elemental damage types available to you in Tiny Tina's Wonderlands. Fire, frost, lightning, poison, and dark magic. When going up against enemies, pay attention to what color their health bar is. This will indicate what elemental damage type works best against them. Fire burns flesh for red health bars. Lightning will zap away any blue bars that you see above them, which is their wards. Poison seeps through armor, which is a yellow bar, and frost chills to the bone, which is a white bar. Since stained frost damage has added bonus of slowing your enemies and eventually freezing them solid into a giant ice cubes, which causes enemies to take triple the amount of melee damage. So going over everything we've covered so far and having an understanding on classes, multi-classes, stats, weapons, elemental damage, and so on, let's put it together and talk about combat. The developers really tried to flesh out the combat system between using magical abilities from spells and weapons. You might find a spell that has multiple charges that allows for continuous casting or resets its own cooldown on a critical hit, which in a few interviews with developers, they have stated that they didn't want to make spells and action skill abilities take too long on cooldowns. Like I stated earlier, when progressing through your skill tree and unlocking new passives, some passive skills will be able to help with cooldowns, damage, critical hits, and how many times you can use your abilities before it goes on a cooldown. Looting certain gear like rings, amulets, armor pieces we spoke of earlier will add to the combat and helping with increased fire rates, reload times, crit damage. Everything will seamlessly work together and even better if you come up with a good build and hunt down gear pieces to create a fate maker of destruction. So as you adventure through Tiny Tina's Wonderland, you're going to come across many different ways to get awesome loot. Rare enemies like loot goblins can be taken out for gear, gold, and XP. They are fast and can take damage do not let them get away. While opening chests, you may just come across a mimic chest that will leap up and attack you. Taking on the chest will drop large amounts of gold and some good loot. One thing you'll definitely want to keep an eye out and look for is a lucky dice. They are scattered all around the Wonderlands. The more lucky dice you pick up, the better the loot it gives you and a permanent luck stat which affects how often high-end gear drops. This is definitely something you want to try and find as early on in the game and keep an eye out for them as much as possible. What else is scattered around the map are puzzles. There are rune switch puzzles in Wonderlands. Now from what I've seen and from others, it's pretty much a speed challenge by getting to each rune in an area before time runs out. There will be a beam of light for each rune that shines a light beacon, so it's not hard to spot them once you start it. If you start this challenge while there are still enemies in that area, it's going to make it a lot more difficult to complete it on time. So I recommend clearing out the enemies from these areas before activating the rune switch. If for some reason you do fail, the runes would just go back to the original starting place and you can go back to starting it all over again. So heading back to Izzy's tavern, there is an ancient obelisk inside the tavern. These obelisks are also found in different areas of the map throughout the Wonderlands as well. The obelisk unlocks challenges for you to take on, which helps break away from the questline structure of the game and gives alternative ways to grind for gear and drops better than average loot. What you will do is take on waves of enemies until you spawn the boss. Once you defeat the boss and the challenge is complete, they are pretty fun. They are going to be many different ways of grinding loot and playing in the Wonderlands. That being said, now let's talk endgame. 
Once you hit max level, which is 40 at launch, you'll unlock Myth Rank, which is a new form of endgame progression that continues to further increase your power. You will get a new leveling bar just for Myth Rank, and each time you fill it, you will receive a Myth Point in your inventory menu. You'll find a collection of constellations, and in which you can spend any Myth Points, the constellations are split into four quadrants, each representing a new form of mastery, say Druid, which is strengthening your companion damage and synergy stats, Archmage supplementing your spellcasting abilities, Blade Master all about melee damage, and your Deadeye focusing on gun proficiency. Each time you level up your myth rank, you'll move to the next quadrant in a clockwise motion. In other words, you'll be diversifying your points across all four quadrants so you won't be able to solely focus on one. Now the reasoning behind myth rank isn't just to add more XP bars to keep you grinding for say a new game plus or just until further DLC, it is actually to become strong enough to test yourself in another new form of endgame called chaos levels. So to summarize chaos levels, which is your chaos chamber runs, at their most basic, a normal chaos chamber run is a randomized challenge that should take anywhere from 20 to 30 minutes to complete. Your path through, say, any type of randomized dungeon goes like this. Three randomized dungeon rooms where you'll need to clear out a number of enemies before you can proceed. Then there is a mini boss fight, followed by three more dungeon rooms, and finally a full-on main boss fight as the grand finale. Each time you complete a room that isn't immediately before a boss fight, you'll open two portals that give you a degree of choice over what you'll encounter in the next room. You have three lives to make it to the end of the dungeon. Lose them all and your run is a failure, but don't worry about it because you get to keep any weapons or gear that you do pick up during the run. Now, Kent Rochford said there are over 60 level layouts which will mix and match throughout each dungeon run, who is the lead game designer in Tiny Tina Wonderlands. On top of all of that, he says, all the many types of enemies from the game can show up with up to three different kinds of armies in one room. There are also explosive barrels and traps that populate based on the room. Some are smaller, some are bigger. Our level designers, he said, went out with what they felt appropriate for each particular combat arena. Now, completing Chaos Chamber runs is a great way to farm for loot. Once you finish the main story campaign, but it's even more important for those who are looking to min-max your gear and assemble all pieces of your perfect character build, right? By successfully beating Chaos Chamber, you'll earn moon orbs, an in-game currency you can spend at the Enchantment Reroller Station in Brighthoof. Every time you use the Enchantment Reroller, you'll be offered a random replacement for an enchantment effect on your gear or the option to keep one you've got. By re-rolling the enchantments on your favorite pieces of gear, you can push their power even further by finding the enchantment that best synergizes with your loadout. Rerolling won't take many orbs when you first start out, but it'll be exponentially, exponentially expensive the more times you re-roll the same item. So pretty much a summary of what Chaos Chamber really is. It's pretty much a roguelike end game where you can constantly rerun dungeons it has multiple different levels so it doesn't feel like you're rerunning the same dungeon over and over again you're going to want to collect as many crystals as possible so you can implement blessings on you there are also curses to make dungeon runs a lot more harder with a lot more chances of increase higher and loot and you can also feed your crystals to these rabbit statues that is an icon above them that represents a type of loot in tiny tina's wonderland like guns smgs assault rifles anything like that wearable gear rings and amulets and so on by feeding a statue some of those crystals you've accumulated over your run you can make it barf up a random piece of loot from its respective loot type now, through this method, you have the means to chase after the best items for certain gear slots while enjoying random madness, inherit the chaos chamber, right? So that's pretty much what you could take away from this. I mean, you can get bragging rights, you know, besides all the loot spewing ra rabbit statues, something else you can enjoy after each successful completion of a chaos chamber is there's a victory screen that's jam-packed with info that recaps your entire run. Here you'll be able to get an overall look at offense and defense stats, 
per weapon kills, ward damage, etc. So a lot of these things come into play, but it's mostly a roguelike to get better end gear. But another feature you'll find in the Chaos Chamber is the Chaos Trial, but they said we won't hear anything more about that until later on closer to the launch of the Wonderlands. Now, with all that, guys, wrapping it up, Gearbox has confirmed, in case you have missed it, that Wonderlands is completely cross-play across all platforms. So you also still have your classic couch... Uh, cl couch classic couch style co-op say that 10 times fast now there are three different editions by the way if you didn't know this that you can pre-order from and if you choose to do so which are the standard edition which is just your 60 dollars game which is just the full game no upgraded next gen feature by the way then there is the next level edition which is 70 dollars that comes with the full game and the next gen optimizations for ps5 and xbox series x and s plus the dragon lord pack then there's the third edition, which is the Chaotic Great Edition, which comes with everything, the optimization for next gen, the Dragon Lord pack, and the season pass that includes Butt Stallion pack and po four post-launch content drops for $80. But with that all being said, you guys, I hope this video wasn't terribly long for you and helped you guys out a lot. I hope you know you got a better understanding just before launch and if you're looking at this video post launch because there's still a lot of info in here just for a good starter guide and help you get a better head start and understanding of what you can expect in the wonderlands you can follow me on twitter at hambone gaming and if you have any questions don't be afraid to leave them down in the comments i'm always down there the best i can to help answer anything you guys have so with that being said i will catch you all in the next one later mm -hmm.